even when you are absolutely 100% objectively sure that you are right. So, for example, maybe you are a vegetarian and you have million reasons because not being vegetarian is cruel to animals, it pollutes the environment, it creates unnecessary suffering, uh, it's not healthy and in these farms they use all kinds of chemicals and uh, antibiotics and uh, in farming they use pesticides and, and so on and so on. So, you believe that we should all be vegetarians uh, and that uh, agriculture should be based on organic farming with no genetically modified and so on and so on. Okay, that is point of view that is easily defendable. There are a lot of good reasons, with, uh, your reasoning kicks in, that will tell you that all people should be vegetarians. And please, if you feel so, be a vegetarian, that's great, but don't get attached to it. Because what will happen sooner or later? One day you're going to reunite with your old friend from high school, you haven't seen him or her for 20 years. And you're really looking forward to that. And you meet at the restaurant and you will order some vegetarian or vegan meal and she will say, I would like a steak, bloody as hell. And if you are attached to the idea that everyone should be vegetarian, and if you resist the idea that some people are still eating meat, you will suffer. That concept, without even seeing or looking at that steak, just by saying to a waiter, I would like a steak, you will be in desire, in anger, in pride, because your friend is stupid you are better somehow than him, holier than thou. <laughs> or you will be in a shame or in a guilt because oh, that's terrible. I, I, I must do something about that. I must save my friend from his own non-vegetarianism. And that is a road to hell. Certainly, you can offer your perspective. You can talk about it. You can mention that you are vegetarian for the last 20 years and then your friend will say, yeah, but you know, my doctor told me that's not healthy. And now you can offer your point of view, but without being attached, because if you are attached, that means that you are right and the other person is wrong and that leads to violence. Doesn't necessarily mean that violence will be physical violence, it can be emotional violence, it can be verbal violence. If you are attached to the idea that everyone should be vegetarian, your friend ordering meat will put you in a vibration of, let's say, anger, because you have unfulfilled desire that everyone should be vegetarian, and that evening will completely turn for the worse, because you will start to speak to your friend from the vibration of anger on any topic, not just on topic of vegetarianism. So, wherever you catch yourself in thinking how the world would be a much better place, only if everyone just had the same point of view or perspective as I am, you are bound to suffer. And you will, well, you will contribute to the world's violence. You cannot fight what you don't like. Invest your energy in things that you do like, but don't fight what you don't like, because it will just create a counter effect. Your friend will, no, your old friend that you never, you haven't seen for 30 years, will not be as happy to see you if you attack him that he or she should be vegetarian, because either he or she doesn't care, and that's actually a better solution. But let's say, for example, that your friend knows, at least subconsciously, that eating meat is a form of cruelty to animals and so on. 
that will put him or her in the vibration of guilt and shame because I should be better than that. I'm guilty because I'm still eating meat. And you talking to him, yeah, you should do it tomorrow, you are just rubbing that terrible vibration of guilt and shame into him. Please don't do that. You know. And what else? We are also attached to our reputation. We are attached to our social status. We are to attached to education. We are attached to nationality. So maybe you are a, a quantum physicist. You are a really very well educated person. And there is certain allure to that idea of being quantum physicist. You are not going to talk with you know, people who are not at your level. You are attached to the idea that everyone should be as smart as you. You resist the idea talking with people who have nothing to contribute to your um, <laughs> conversation. And you don't know that because every person is a genius for something. And if you dismiss someone just because uh, he is uh, he's not as smart as you, you are missing great opportunities because that person, maybe she's just a cleaning woman in your company and of course you are head of your department, but she knows a lot more about, let's say, plants. And she has very interesting perspective that's different from yours. I agree, but nevertheless, don't get attached and don't resist the idea that other people could somehow contribute to your well, conversation or well-being just because they are not from the same social status, they are not from the same education, and so on and so on. We are also worried about our reputation. So, you know, once we are uh, well established in uh, as author, as writer, as songwriter, as whatever, we tend to, you know, be much more afraid about what people are going to think about us because we don't want to lose that social status that we somehow achieved and we resist the idea of losing it. That's the same thing. So, you know, once now I can say whatever I, I want in this, but once I am famous, I will need to really be careful while I am speaking. <laughs> because I don't want to lose my social status or whatever. But nevertheless, to just make bottom line, it's not about circumstances. It, all those circumstances, people, events, concepts, emotions, and so on, teachings uh, and um, emotions and uh, fantasies, all that we talked about. Suffering is not about them. Suffering is about your attitude towards them. You know, just as the famous Captain Jack Sparrow from the movie Pirates of the Caribbean says, the problem is not the problem. The problem is your attitude about the problem. And that's really great news because you can't choose the circumstances, but you certainly can choose your attitude towards them. And your attitude is all about your attachments and all about your resistances. So next time some situation makes you angry, or depressed, or in a level desire, or fearful, when just take a closer look at what you are attached to and what you resist. And just analyze it. And because now you know that your attachment to it is what creates your suffering. And it has nothing to do with circumstances. Maybe now you will understand a quote from Gandhi that's really not that well understood. And he said, no one 
can hurt me without my permission. What do you mean no one can hurt me without my permission? <laughs> I mean, of course they can. Well, actually they can't, because you being hurt is only a matter of your own attachments and your own resistances to that particular situation. So, let's say, for example, that after this lecture, someone will come to you and say, you know what, I've been watching you for the whole evening and you are really an annoying person. <laughs> That has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with that person's attachments and aversions. So, maybe you remind him or her of someone that he really dislikes. And that cre creates in his own mind feelings and thoughts and perceptions and even memories <laughs> that are unpleasant and they are getting what they don't like. And if you are really smart, you can take advantage of that. Whenever you are annoyed with some uh, people or situations or concepts that someone is talking about, and you feel, you know, angry or you have desire to see, make them see things your way, just take a look at your own resistances, at your own clingings and cravings and graspings. Why that situation, that person, that idea, that concept, why that makes you angry. Why that puts you in a vibration that you do not prefer. And by doing that, you will find more about yourself. You will find out what your attachments are, what your resistances are, and then you can just let them go. And that person, that situation that made you angry or anxious was a great teacher and Thank you! I am so grateful <laughs> that you created a situation or concept or whatever that made me angry or that put me in a level of fear or that puts me in a level of guilt and shame because now I know more about me and now I can correct my own resistances toward that idea or that person or that situation because I know that my vibratory state has nothing to do with outer circumstances, only with how am I going to respond, what my vibratory attitude is going to be towards that. And that has everything to do with me and me only or to be more precise, with my own attachments and with my own versions. So, just let go. And you will feel like some space is creating inside you. Some, something was released. You will feel lighter. And that is a really, really good thing. You know, just let it go. Learn from that situation and then let it go. And there is a lot of confusion uh, about that concept of let go, because some people assume that when you say let go of a situation that you don't like, that means, you know, some kind of ignoring. It's a kind of passive resignation. No, 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 it's nothing like that. It's not passive reason. It's not like, oh, well, that situation is terrible and I don't care. It's just a matter of working with life, with circumstances that made you angry or anxious or worried or something like that. Not fighting them. That is a huge difference. And from time to time, someone will uh, say to you something that will make you really mad. And the first thing that really you should ask yourself is, would I rather be happy or right? Because it has everything to do with your attachments and your aversions, and it has everything to do 
with your attitude toward them and it has nothing to do with circumstances. Of course you are right, of course you are feeling right, because your mind makes it real. And you will always feel right. <laughs> but the real trick is to use the circumstances that you do not like, that are putting you in a vibration that you don't like, and find out what you are filtering them through. So, this is all about filtering your perception, filtering your inputs that are coming through your senses, through your mind, that's creating attachments, aversions, and so on and so on, and putting you in a vibratory state that you actually don't prefer. Learn from that. And you know what? In life, there is a lot of opportunity to do just that. Because we are resisting and attaching and craving and clinging and rejecting and denying all the time. <laughs> and let me prove that to you. So, tomorrow it will be, let's say, Monday. At Monday, you will open your eyes, your alarm clock will make ti -di -ti -di -ti -di -ti -di, and you will open your eyes and you know that you need to go to work. What is the first thought that comes to your mind? It is either I didn't get enough sleep <laughs> or I don't have enough time. And then already Five seconds after you're waking up, you are already in a state of anxiety. Because you are attached to the idea that you should have more sleep, and you resist the idea that you don't have enough time. I mean, that means I am not free to do what I would really like, and I resist that. I would like to stay in bed. I don't want to get up. I would like today to be Saturday or Sunday, so that I don't need to go to work. I want Saturday, I don't want Monday. And then you get up and you make a quick breakfast, because you know, you're already late, some, somehow in your head, and then you sit in your car and you drive to your office. And of course, there's a traffic jam. <laughs> And immediately you are angry because why now or afraid because I'm going to be late at work and I'm going to lose my job and I'm going to get fired and that's a terrible thing because I will die <laughs> because I won't have anything to eat. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so you are angry and instead you could be enjoying a beautiful day. Maybe it's a sunny day and everything is fine and sure you're driving towards your office. Does you being angry makes you go any faster? <laughs> of course not. In fact, while you're driving, anyone who is driving slower than you is an idiot, and anyone who is driving faster than you is a maniac. And <laughs> you're not driving at the same speed every day. So there's, it's not about them, it's about you. You believing that you don't have enough time, and you have resistance toward going to work, and you don't want to go to work, you want to stay at home, you want to go to the park, and you want to have beautiful time with your friends, and so on, and so on. And then, of course, the next thought, and it's only Monday. <gasps> it's the beginning of week, I don't want it to be Monday, at least I want it to be Friday. <laughs> if not Saturday or Sunday, I don't want it to be Monday. And then there is a traffic jam. Why there is a traffic jam? Because some workers are repairing the road. They are repairing the road during the rush hour and at Monday. They are idiots. I want roads to be repaired when I'm not on the road. <laughs> and I don't want roads to be repaired right now because it creates a traffic jam and and I have even less time, and I am afraid that I will lose my job, and I am ashamed because what other people will think of me, because I'm always late, and I will feel guilty, and so on, and so on, and so on. And then you come to your office, and your office secretary is extremely cheerful that day. And she says, oh, hello, beautiful morning, welcome. And immediately you hate her. 
<laughs> because you're not cheerful <laughs> and you have all kinds of excuses, you know, and then you remember, you know, that's because she's young. She's maybe only 25 years old. When I was 25, I was that cheerful, but no, what happened then? That life happened to me and blah, 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 blah. And I actually resent her being in a good mood. <laughs> but then she says, oh, you know, uh, boss uh, wants to meet you in uh, 10 minutes. Immediately you're in a state of, well, fear, afraid, anxious. Why? What's going on? Did I do something wrong? Guilt? Shame? Uh, what does he want from me? I can't lose the job. I need this job. And so on and so on. And then you spend for the next 10 minutes in absolute agony because who knows what he wants. And then actually it's great news because he's offering you promotion. More money? Yes, I want more money. Better social status? Yes, I want better social status. But at the same time, it will be, you mean, a longer office hours. You will need to work more, so you will have even less time and you don't want that. And maybe he's offering you a position in international sales. So sometimes you will have to work during the night because, you know, your clients are maybe in China and you are somewhere in Europe. And during their office hours, it is, I don't know, 3 a.m. in the morning for you. So sometimes you will needs to pull some extra weight and you don't want that, you resist that, but you do want more money and that creates confusion in your mind. <laughs> and of course, then your self-doubt kicks in because who knows if I'm going to be good at that job, you know, maybe I will fail, maybe I won't be as good. Am I really good? Uh, will I really be good at the job. What if I fail? What if I mess up something? And that's another form of resistance. Because you are resisting your natural self. You are questioning your ability to do that job. And you want more money, but you don't want more work and so on and so on. And that creates a terrible situation. <laughs> and then while you're thinking about that, you are some a uh, little bit in a fear, a little bit in a desire, want more money, but also what if I fail, but also uh, if I refuse, maybe he will give, fire me and so on, and it's all very confusing. And then you sit at your desk and you get a newsletter from your favorite travel agency and they're saying, you know, next week, Discount 50% to our vacation to a beautiful tropical island. And you want that. Oh, I need that. I want that vacation. I don't want to be in office. I want to go on a vacation. Why am I not rich already? <laughs> Why wasn't I born rich? That's even better. Because I want vacation. I need vacation. I am and if you are really need, if you really want that vacation, it will probably be angry because why can't I go to that vacation? <laughs> and then you will go to lunch. And you will order the same thing that you ordered last week and it was excellent, but today it's not that tasty. And you are angry because you have unfulfilled desire to have your lunch, better tasting lunch. <laughs> okay, so now you're angry because that uh, lunch that you are paying is not as good as it should be, or it's not as good as it was last week. These idiots in the kitchen don't know what they're doing. And then you get back to your office, and then you open maybe your Facebook feed or something like it, Instagram feed, and then you get all those beautiful quotes like, love yourself, you know, take your time, follow your passion, indulge yourself. And then you say, oh, indulge myself. Oh, you know what? My back really hurts. I need a massage. Yes, that's what I need. I don't want to sit in office. I want to go on a massage. <laughs> okay. And then you sit in your car after the office hours and you're driving home. And then you come home and then whole a different bunch of problems because, you know, there's, there are dishes to wash 
and your partner is not helping enough and you told him 100 times to pick that trash before going to work and to, to carry it outside and he didn't even do that and and it's all on you and oh poor little me and so on and you are resisting the situation and it is you are fighting the situation as it is because you are attached to the idea that your partner should be helping you more and you have resistance to the idea that he is not helping you enough and that puts you right now in a really really terrible vibration and you know what at the end of the day you go to brush your teeth, to, to go to sleep, and then you notice dark circles under your eyes. You are tired. And you assume that you are tired because you have a lot to do and everything is lying on your, you know, shoulders and you are carrying the weight of the world around and nobody is helping you and so on and so on. But actually, you are not tired, you are uninspired, you know, what's really tiring, what is draining your energy is your resistance, your fighting the life that is what it is and you are attached, you are clinging, you are craving, you are grasping some other form of life that you prefer that you think that you prefer. That would be much more precise. You know what? You don't need that. Just let it go. And accept what is. And when you accept what is, instead fighting what isn't, and you think that you should be <laughs> doing or how your life, you are insisting and insistence is resistance. Resistance is draining your energy. Because all you need to do is stop that mental complaining. You know, all you're doing is create a mental complaining, judgments. This is good, this is bad, this should be this way, this should be that way. You are labeling. This one man is crazy, this one is stupid, I want this, I want all that. You are worrying, you are fighting what is, you are insisting that your life must go in a certain way and you just, you know, don't want it to go any other way. You are insisting and insistence is also resistant and actually what you are creating is self-inflicted misery. So all suffering all misery in life, all emotional pain is self-inflicted. You are doing it to yourself. You, know? you should notice what is. Learn from that situation because if, I mean, if that situation is creating pleasant feelings, great. If it's creating unpleasant feelings of she gave shame, guilt, fear, anger, and so on. Take a look at that situation. Own it. Do not go into denial. That is our natural response. You know, it's not about me. It's about them. It's about circumstances. It's not about me. I deny that my own attachments and resistances are creating this vibration that I'm in. And I really want things to be different. <laughs> when things are different, I will be happy. Once I get what I want. You won't be happy when you get what you think you want right now. Because on the level of desire, when you think, want things to be in a certain way, all you are creating are more desires. And maybe you think that one million dollars is more than enough to make you happy for the rest of your life. But once you reach the $800,000 threshold, $2 million will sound even better. And then five, and then ten, and it never ever ends. You just need to accept what is, learn from it. But first you need to own it. You need to own it because you can't change anything you don't own. 
You can't change the color of this room because you don't own this room, but you can change the color of your own bedroom because you own that bedroom. You can change it. So you accept responsibility. You say, yes, I'm feeling bad about that situation. And I'm really grateful for that situation because now I will be able to learn something new about myself. And then you accept it and then you own it and then you can change it and you will change it by finding out what your resistances and what your attachments are. Or in the words of the greatest psychiatrist ever, Carl Gustav Jung, we cannot change anything until we accept it. Condemnation does not liberate, it oppresses. Everything that annoys you Everything that makes you nervous or anxious or ashamed or guilty is a great opportunity to learn more about yourself. And it is a great, great news because you are in charge. You are in control. It's all about your attachments and your resistances. And you know, you can't control outer circumstances, but you can control your own attachments and aversions resistances and in that way you can use all the negative so-called negative uh, inputs from the outside as a tool as a teaching tool and be grateful to them so first great insight that we get from buddhas for noble truth is that all suffering is self-inflicted and it is not about the circumstances Suffering is about your chosen attitude toward the circumstances. And this is nothing new, because from the recap of the second chapter, we have this sentence. Your vibratory state, meaning happiness, inspiration, creativity, has nothing to do with external circumstances, only with how you choose to respond to these circumstances. It's actually the same thing. It's just that we reach to the same conclusion from two completely different paths. So, first path was by Dr. David Hawkins, Map of Consciousness. Second path was from Buddha's Four Noble Truths. And they lead to the same place. Kind of. Because <laughs> if you are really careful about what we are saying here, is so Buddha says, you know, just suffering is self-inflicted and it is about you. So he talks about suffering, removal of suffering. And Dr. David Hawkins says, you know, circumstances are not the one who creates your vibratory state. Your vibratory state is about how you respond. So Buddha is talking about suffering and Dr. David Hawkins is talking about happiness. And maybe that will sound funny to you because, you know, not being unhappy and being happy are not exactly the same thing, right? We want to be happy, not just to remove suffering. Removing suffering will not make me happy, right? Well, it will. And it is the second great insight that Buddha gave us in his very concise <laughs> Four Noble Truths. And that is, Happiness is your natural state. When you remove whatever makes you unhappy, you are getting back to your natural state of being, not filtered through your mind, who will make it real, whatever circumstances are going on will make them real. So once you remove suffering, you are rising your vibration. You don't need to add anything to you. You just need to remove what you are not. Or in Buddha's own words, it is in the nature of things that joy arises in a person free from remorse. All you need to do is remove what you do not prefer what you are not, what does not resonate with you. You just need to find out about your attachments and about your resistances and let them go. 
and once you let them go, once you let weights that are holding you down, you will naturally lift your vibration. That is kind of surprising, but it is in the nature of things. It's just the way it is. You know? It's just like Michelangelo, you know, the great sculptor Michelangelo. He created some real gorgeous sculptures, masterpieces like Pietà or David. And uh, someone asked him once, oh my God, Michelangelo, I mean, this, this is gorgeous. How could you create this beautiful sculpture from, you know, a piece of uh, stone? And he said, you know what? David was already in the stone. I just removed the extraneous stone. I just removed what David was not. Okay. And by removing what David was not, there it is, David as we know him today. Okay. So you don't need to add anything to you. You are already perfect, <laughs> as in Eastern traditions they would say. You're already perfect. What you need is to remove from yourself what you are not. It's kind of like, you know, balloon. You know, those balloon, hot air balloons. So there is a balloon and then here you are inside. And these balloons often have some weights that's called ballast. And the only function of these weights is to keep you at a certain attitude. If you want to go higher, what you need to do is cut one of those ballasts. Okay, then you will make yourself lighter and the balloon will go higher naturally. You don't need anything to add to that balloon, only remove ballast weight that you don't need if you want to go higher. And that is why I am strongly opposed, personally, to calling this, uh, what we are talking about, you know, self-help or self-improvement. Because self-improvement means that there is a better version of yourself somewhere in the future. Okay. And if there is a better version of me in the future, that means that this version now is not good enough. And that immediately puts you in a guilt and shame because you are not good enough or you are afraid or you are worried about what people will think of you because you should be better. Please don't do that. Please don't do self-help and please don't uh, do self-improvement. What you should do is self-exploration, self-discovery. Find out what you already are. And when you find out what you already are, the path to finding what you already are is by removing from yourself what you are not. As great poet Rumi said, your task is not to seek for love, but merely to seek and find all the barriers within yourself that you have built against it. Of course, when Rumi talks about love, he talks about this kind of love. It's unconditional love. It's not being in love, being attached to your partner and being in a kind of constant resistance and rejection that something will go wrong with your relationship. It's about this love. It's about love of life. Okay. So this is second brilliant insight from Buddha's Four Noble Truths, and that is that happiness is your natural state. All you need to do is remove what you are not. But there is also a third brilliant point that Buddha made. And he gave us the cure. And the cure is Buddha's Eightfold Path. It is a path. It is not a destination or target or aim. It is a path. It is about being
being in a right vibration right now and then the next moment and then in the next moment and then in the next moment and by being happy in every particular moment you have a happy life it's not about arriving there it is about enjoying your journey uh, and these are two completely different things and in the Eastern traditions they found that out thousands of years ago and they created all kinds of uh, riddles <laughs> that we don't understand today that are pointing to just that for example, great Lao Tse, Chinese philosopher, Taoist philosopher he said a skillful traveler has no fixed plans and is not intent upon arriving what do you mean skillful traveler has not intent upon arriving? I mean, isn't that the whole point? Traveler is going from point A to point B. He wants to get to the point B. If he doesn't get to point B, he failed, right? No. He has no intent in arriving because he's open to anything. He trusts that life will bring him opportunities and situations that will allow him to learn a little bit more about himself, to remove his own attachments, to remove his own resistances, to learn a little bit more about himself. And that's the point. That's the whole point. It's, there is no point in arriving. Point is in traveling. Or if you prefer Buddha, that's fine. He said, there is no path to happiness. Happiness is the path. Happiness is the path. There is no path to happiness. And what's equally confusing in the fourth noble truth, where Buddha talks about you know, cure for that, he says that the cure for our suffering is meditation and the way of life that is consistent with it, that doesn't create unnecessary suffering for ourselves or for others, and so on. And that is another confusing concept for, uh, well, for, my, for our Westerners. <laughs> because are you really saying that me sitting quietly, doing absolutely nothing, will somehow make me happy? Yes. Yes, and that goes, explanation for that goes a little bit beyond scope of this uh, course but it will, we will explain it in much more detail in another course. It will be probably called Course in Meditation or something like that. By sitting quietly and kind of trying to turn off your mind. And that's not as easy as it seems. But by turning off your mind, you are in a way making the mind more visible. You are able to cut through the jungle of your thoughts because there are fewer of them and then you can look at them without any judgment, without worrying, without mental complaining and accept them and work with them and that is a much more efficient. You know, you can imagine life like a river and you can sit on the boat in the middle of a river and just let the current lead you. Maybe just a little bit here and a little bit there, you will uh, correct your path, but just a tiny little bit. If you try to swim upstream, <laughs> or if you try to cling to the right side of the river, to right bank and not to the left bank, so you don't want a left bank, you want right bank, it will be much more well, maybe not only difficult, but tiresome. You don't need to do that. Road already knows where it leads. So your life is leading you somewhere and your life knows what best, what's best for you. We'll talk a lot about that in chapters that are coming. But you accept responsibility for your state and trust life that will bring you exactly the circumstances and situations and people that you actually need, not that you think that you need, that you actually need. 
Third brilliant point from Buddha's Four Noble Truths is that there is no path to happiness. Happiness is the path. And please note, it is a path, it is not a destination. The thing that our mind reacts to, things that are making us worry or fearful or anxious or angry or um, guilty or so, are exactly the situation that are pointing us to uh, our own attachments and our own aversions. And this is really powerful stuff. And we are only halfway there because, as you remember, causes of our suffering are desire and ignorance. So this was all about desire. And ignorance is much, much more interesting and even more powerful.